good morning students today i'm back with another topic it's a very short topic and today we are going to cover the indo pak war the first indo pak war of 1947-48 okay so let us start now today we are going to talk about the indo pak war of 1947-48 and we will carry on with the other wars also now today we are going to learn about the Kashmir issue and why is it still an issue for both India and Pakistan so we have to go back in history and learn about it as to why even today India and Pakistan is fighting a war we might not see it in the TV screens, but even today, as I talk to you right now, there is a lot of tension in the border area, especially the line of control. And what is the line of control? We are going to talk about it today. Okay? Now let us start. The background regarding the Indo Pak War. The first Indo Pak War is also known as the First Kashmir War, also. Okay, now Britain control of India between the 15th and 19th century. So, if you see, the British actually controlled India for about two to three hundred years, and India fought for its independence, as we all know, throughout the 19th to 20th century. And as a result, in 1947, we got our independence. Now, in India, we have two major groups which we know as the the majority the hindu population and then we have the muslim population okay so the root cause if you see is between these two communities regarding the the kashmir issue also then the indian national congress was created in 19 uh, sorry 1885 which was a predominantly a hindu organization because most of the members were were Hindus and there were a lot of Muslims also. Now, the Muslim League was created in 1906 in the capital of today what we know as Bangladesh, Dhaka. And this was a predominantly a Muslim organization which was to counter the so called Hindu Congress Party. Okay? Now, after a lot of struggle, now this is the map of India pre-partition. Now, if you look over here, Pakistan, Bangladesh were all part of India, that undivided India at that part of time. Now, what we today know as British India. Now, as we went towards the independence What happened is that there was a fight between the Congress Party and the Muslim League. The Muslim League wanted an independent country for the Muslims and all the do Muslim dominated areas to be part of New Pakistan. Okay? As a result, now what happened is not only there were states in India, provinces in India, but there were also a lot of princely states. For example, Kashmir. Now, the strange, the, the best, or not, I would not call it strange, but the best part was that in Kashmir, majority of the people or the citizens were Muslims, whereas it was being ruled by a Hindu Raja, Maharaja Hari Singh. And if you go towards Deccan, we had the state of Hyderabad. Now, in Hyderabad, again, there was a Muslim Nawab, whereas the majority of the citizens were all Hindus. So, there were many, many states or many, many princely states in India at that particular time where this type of, this type of thing was there, that either it was a Muslim Raja ruling a uh, majority Hindu population or a Hindu Raja ruling a majority Muslim population. Now, 
Let us see what happened. Now, India received independence from Britain in 1947. Two nationalism organizations were created, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. And Mohandas Karamchand and Gandhi supported both groups to get peace between the two groups. And Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, became the leader of Pakistan. He became the governor general. He was not the president. Okay? Now, this is where it all started. Because when India got independent, there was a person called Cyril Ratcliffe. So he was brought from England and he was supposed to divide India and Pakistan according to the Louis Mountbatten plan. Now, I'll just give you an example. If a person comes from Calcutta and starts talking about Kalimpong or the different parts of Kalimpong, will he be able to know all the details? I am afraid no. A person living in Kalimpong would be able to give all the details as to where these places are. So the same way if a person from England is coming to India to divide India, now what would be the consequences? He would not be able to go and visit all those places. So he would sit in some office and draw up a map. And that is the same thing what happened. Sir Radcliffe, Sir Cyril Radcliffe went ahead and divided India on basis of the maps which he was given to him. And then, as a result, what happened? India was divided into two countries. One was called Pakistan and the other was called East Pakistan, which we today know as Bangladesh. Then, Britain sent Louis Mountbatten to India as the Viceroy to negotiate independence. Louis Mountbatten acknowledged that the civil war was inevitable, so he imposed a partition and he created a Hindu state India and a Muslim state Pakistan. So India was a majority Hindu nation. As a result, now what happened is two states were created. Because the Muslims did not want to live in independent India, as a result, the in India got partitioned in 1947. Now, this is Nui Mountbatten's plan. West Pakistan, East Pakistan. Now, this is where the problem lies. Because pa Kashmir, since it had a Hindu Raja, and a, and a Muslim population or citizens, they were given a free hand saying that, okay, if you want to secede to India, you can, or if you want to secede to Pakistan, you can. As a result, now what happened is, the Raja of Kashmir took a little time in giving his decision as to whether to join India or to join Pakistan. And that is where the Kashmir dispute started. Okay? Now, Louis Mountbatten's plan was a weak solution. Britain continued to interfere in India even after independence was achieved. And the partition created mass migration, homelessness, integration into a new society. Now, suddenly, when India got independent and Pakistan was created, Suddenly, now, a huge population was left homeless overnight. As a result, now what happened is, lots and lots of Hindus from Pakistan migrated to India, and lots of Muslims from India migrated to Pakistan. And as a result, there was huge riots. You must have seen many documentaries, many films regarding the partition of India. It was one of the biggest mobilization of people on earth during that time. And I think even in the present also, if you see, there is the biggest human migration from one part to another. And as a result of that, many, 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 many people died. Many people died of riots. Many people died of starvation. 
Many people died of thirst, hunger. As a result, in India, there was a civil war-like situation. Because suddenly now, lots of new people were coming to India. And suddenly, they were homeless in one part of India. And they were migrating to Pakistan. Okay? Now, the picture which you see at this point of time is Raja Hari Singh of Kashmir. So he was the main person who actually was in the middle of the Kashmir dispute because he could not give an instant decision. And as a result of that, the first war of Kashmir actually started. Now, the division between Western and Eastern Pakistan of India were highlighted in different economic and religious issues. Three princely states were given the opportunity to close independence or confirm their allegiance to India or Pakistan. One was Kashmir, one was Mysore, and one was Hyderabad. Now in Hyderabad, what happened is that since it was right in the middle of India, Mysore also, if you see, it's in South India. As a result, now what happened is that these Nawabs actually wanted to join Pakistan. However, since the population at that particular time were all majority Hindus, so they decided to stay with India. But the problem lied with Kashmir. Now, because the, the, the Raja of Kashmir could not give a definite answer as to whether to join India or to, Paki or to join Pakistan, what happened is a lot of tension started happening in Kashmir. And as a result, now what happened is there was an uprising by some Kashmiris and that advantage was taken by Pakistan who sent in Lashkar. Now Lashkar means in Urdu means an army of tribals and they invaded Kashmir. Okay? Now, India and Pakistan valued this area. It was ruled by a Hindu but Kashmir was mostly a Muslim uh, populated area. Muslims rose up against the Hindu minorities and Pakistan sent men to overthrow the government in less than a month. The Ramharaja appealed to India for military aid in October in return for service that Kashmir would be occupied by or would be taken over by India. This ignited the Pakistan to send an army in 1948. As a result, as soon as with not even a year had passed that India and Pakistan got into a conflict which was also known as the First Kashmir War. Okay, now, both India and Pakistan armies were receiving guidance from the British military. Indian military used aircraft and armored cars to transport troops to the capital of Kashmir. A stalemate was reached in 1948 and a ceasefire agreement was reached. Now, in this, in this particular few months of the hostilities, now what happened is India at that particular time had no troops in Kashmir. And as a result of that, the Lashkar along with the Pakistan army went ahead and captured half of Kashmir, including Shirinagar, which is now today the capital of Kashmir, the summer capital of Kashmir. Now, when this happened, the Raja appealed for help to India and India sent its troops and the troops went ahead and pushed the Lashkar the tribal militants as well as the Pakistan army to today what we know as the line of control. Okay, now in 1948 there was a ceasefire and the first Kashmir war came to an end. Now let us see the effects. Around 1500 soldiers were killed and many many casualties and many many more were wounded. Uh, the civilian casualties were more than 1,000 people, uh, common people died during this war. Kashmir became a part of India 
and then the Pakistan army still occupies the northern part of Kashmir. So what you see today, let's see, this is the part of India. We have West Pakistan, Kashmir is there, and then East Pakistan is there. Okay, now, see, this is what the map actually looks like today. Even though in India, the Indian map, we see the whole part of Kashmir belonging to India, but in reality, it is not like that. In reality, if you see, this is today what we know as the international border. Okay, this is the international border. Whereas, this particular thing is the line of control. Now, India controls this part of Kashmir, whereas Pakistan controls this part of Kashmir. And this, in the last, top, in the last class we have talked about, this particular area, the Askai Chin area, is controlled by China. So whatever you see in the map of India is actually not true. Okay? Only the half of Kashmir actually now today belongs to India. And today, this is the line which we today know as the line of control. And even today as I speak, there must be a lot of, it is a live line, which means that every day firing takes place. And a lot of Uh, soldiers as well as civilians get hurt every day because even today this is not the actual international border India claims this part of Kashmir whereas Pakistan claims this part of Kashmir so this is the actual line which separates India and Pakistan Kashmir so, with this we come to the end of the class. I hope you all have understood. And in the next class, we will talk about the 1965 war and the 1971 war, as well as the 1999 war, which is also known as the Kargil War. Okay, so till then, thank you and hope you have learned a lot today. Okay? Thank you. आयसी का विद्यार्थी अर्ला हार्दिक स्वागत तथा अभिवादन गर्दसु र विशेष गरी हमी आयसी अंतर्गत नेपाली विषय पढ़ने क्रम में चाऊ यस आगे हमें दो और टक कविता पढ़ी शायद का चाऊ नचिनी ने बायसो कविता पनी पढ़ियो यस को साथ साथ है हमें आकाश का तारा किया तारा कविता पनी पढ़ी शायद का चाऊ र आज हम विद्यार्थी अर्ला पढ़ा� सिरसक कविता सही दर को समझना है मैं सिरसक कविता मैं पढ़ाऊँ ना लागी रहेगा सु र विद्यार्थी अर्लाई मैं फेरी एक चोटी आग्रह कर दसु यो लॉकडाउन को समय है यो लायमु लॉकडाउन को समय है मैं विद्यार्थी और घर में ही बस रहा यो ऑनलाइन शिक्षा को फायदा ली रहने ली रहने ली रहने अनि लेख विशेष कर रहा लेखन कार्य में निरंतरता दीने फेरी एक चोटी में विद्यार्थी अलग आग्रह कर दे आज हम आईएससी नेपाली 2021 को निम्ति विद्यार्थी अलग तैयारी कराऊं ने क्रम में हमें लागी परेगा सों रहा सोई क्रम में यो ऑनलाइन शिक्षा चली रहेगा सा लगातार यही क्रम में में आज विद्यार्थी अलग आईएससी � म विद्यार्थी कविता कुंजवा आयसी कविता कुंजवा एटा कविता पढ़ा लगी रहे हमीर पढ़् पर्ने पाठ्यक्रम अंतर्गत हमी कविता कुंजवा कविता पढ़ी रह हमी कथा सुरू करेन उपन्यास पढ़् बाकी पच्छी बा हम फिर तेमा चर्चा परिचर्चा करने हमीर दुईवटा कविता पढ़ी सकता छो अब हमी कवि भूपी शेरचन को शहीद को समझना में शीर्षक कविता यहाँ बा हम पढ़ने जो कविता पाठ आठ में रहे पाठ आठ में रहे कविता 
सहीदर को समझना है वह पढ़ने बंदा आगे मकाबी वोपी सैरसन को परिचय विद्यार्थी और को आगाडी रखना गई रहेगा तो कभी वोपी सैरसन नेपाली साहित्य में एक चर्चित नाम नेपाली साहित्य में एक सफल कवि एक चर्चित कवि कवि वोपी सैरसन जस्ले कुबेर राम रा राम रा कविता आरु लेखेरा नेपाली साहित्य लाई धानी बनाऊने का हम गरेगा सन नेपाली साहित्य में वोपी सैरसन को योगदान मौत पूर्ण था कवि वोपी सैरसन को परिचय हमी पढ़ना लागी रहेगा सों जन्म सन उन्नाइसे सत्तीस मृत्यु सन उन्नाइसे नवासी कवि वोपी सैरसन को पू उनको पूरा नाम बुपी सैरसन मरा रहा है अभी साहित्य में बुपी सैरसन मरा रहा चिंजाओ तो था भी उनको पूरा नाम बुपेंद्र मान सैरसन हो उनको जन्म पश्चिम नेपाल को दाऊलागिरी अंचल को मुस्तांग जिला में पारने थाक टुचुके गांव में बाए को थियो कभी बुपी सैरसन ले बीए सम में शिक्षा आर्जन करेगा थिए कभी � नेपाली कविता साहित्य में वोपी सैरसन निर्भीक र ईमानदार कवि हो निर्भीक को नडराने एकदम जे समाज में जे छे स्थिति तेल जस्ता को तस्त लेखने अथवा जस्ता को तस्त टिपे साहित्य में राखने काम कवि वोपी सैरसन ने कर हम सज को अवस्था आपू ले भोग देखा आपू ले अनुभव कर बटुले ती अनुभव लाई साझा करने का हम साहित्य का मार्ग माध्यम बाँटा साझा करने का हम कभी बुपी सैरसन ले गरेगा सन रब बुपी सैरसन लाई एक जना ईमानदार कवि के रूप में अनि एक जना निर्भीक कवि के रूप में हमी चिंच हो आप बोले देखे का बोगे का अनुभव करेगा कुरार लाई सत्यता सीता आंटीलो बने रखा कविता में प्रस्तुत करनो उनको काव्य लेखन को विशेषता हो उनको कविता लेखन को अथवा साहित्य लेखन को विशेषता और में आप बोले देखे को आप बोले अनुभव करेगो कुरो जो सत्य था जो यथार्थ था त्यो सत्य कुरार लाई आंटीलो बारा नडराई का को विशेषता हो बनर बनने को सा सामाजिक व्यवस्था में रहे का दमन सोशन आदि लाई खुल खुला रूप में विरोध करने विद्रोही का भी बने बन समाज में जून प्रकार को सोशन अन्याय अत्याचार दमन उनसा त्यो अन्याय अत्याचार सोशन दमन लाई बनी विरोध कर रहा खुला रूप में विरोध कर रहा लेखना सकने का भी भूपी सैरसन हु यही कारण कवि भूपी सैरसन विद्रोही कवि को रूप में अथवा एक क्रांति कवि को रूप में हम चिन्न सकता उनका कविता में विद्रोही को भाव पाइए उन्नी मूलत मानवता को सन्देश रहे पाइन उनका कविता में विद्रोही भाव रहे तापनी त्या मानवता को सन्देश मानव भै पी मानव ने गुर्ने कार्य के कस्तो त भूरा उनले दर्शाने चेष्टा कर मानवता को सन्देश उनका कविता में व्यक्त करने चेष्टा कर अथवा व्यक्त कर उनके आप्ना कविता घुमने मेच मधि अंधो मं कृति को निति साझा पुरस्कार प्राप्त करिए प्रदान साझा पुरस्कार एक चर्चित पुरस्कार हो साहित्य को निति प्रदान पुरस्कार साझा पुरस्कार रुमने उनको कृति घुमने मेच मधि अंधो मं भून शीर्षक कविता त्यो कविता का निति उनको कृति को निति साझा पुरस्कार प्रदान थियो उनका प्रकाशित कृति नया झ्याउरे कविता संग्रह निर्जर कविता संग्रह घुमने मेज मधि अंधो मं कविता संग्रह यहां कृति लेखे कविता संग्रह विशेषकर कविता साहित्य में नई कवि भूपी सैरसन को ठूल योगदान कवि भूपी सैरसन एक ईमदार एक निष्पक्ष एक निर्भीक कवि को रूप में हम चिंस समाज को समाज में भई रहने अन्याय अत्याचार शोषण दमन उनके व्यक्त करने चेष्टा देखाने चेष्टा कर यह शोषण रमन को विरुद्ध में उनके कलम चलाया उन्नी एक विद्रोही कवि को रूप में देखा पड़े तथापि उनके मानवता आपने कविता में दर्शाने चेष्टा कर रवि भूपी सैरसन का कृति में नया झ्याउरे कविता संग्रह निर्जर कविता संग्रह घुमने मेज मधि अंधो मं कविता संग्रह इन उनका प्रकाशित कृति हु आज हमी पाठ आठ बा कविता पढ़ना लगी रह कविता को शीर्षक शहीदर को समझना में कवि बुपी शेरचन 
यो कविता हामी पढ्न लागिरहेका छौ र शहीदहरुको सम्झनामा भन्ने छ शीर्षक कविताको शीर्षक शहीद भन्नाले आफ्नो भूमि अथवा आफ्नो मातृभूमि अथवा आफ्नो जन्मभूमि अथवा आफ्नो कर्मभूमि का निम्ति प्राणको उत्सर्ग गर्ने व्यक्ति प्राण को उत्सर्ग करने व्यक्ति हमी शहीद भो भूमि को निम्ति युद्ध लड़ा अथवा आपको भूमि को निम्ति कार्य कर शहीद होने व्यक्ति प्राण उत्सर्ग करने व्यक्ति जिस हम शहीद भरी आप को निति आपको भूमि को निति आप जगह को रक्षा को निति आपको मतृभूमि को झगड़ा को निति आप प्राण को आहुति दिन भी हाँसी हाँसी प्राण को आहुति दिन भी तत्पर रहने ती वीर योद्धा को वर्णन अथवा वीर योद्धा को योगदान यो कविता में उनके दर्शाने चेष्टा कर ती वीर योद्धा को समझना करेखी कविता कारण यो कविता को शीर्षक नई शहीद को समझना में राखी को कविता हर हो बिहान मिर्मिर में तारा झरे नगए बंदन मूलुक दुई चार सपूत मरे नगए ओठ में हाँसो गाला में लाली जब आँच जगत को देश को पीर ने भेटी जब वीर ने चढ़ाऊँ रगत को अब यहाँ कवि होन बिहान मिर्मिर में मिर्मिरे में तारा झरे नगए बंदन मूलुक दुई चार सपूत मरे नगए एवं देश निर्माण को निम्ति आपको भूमि मूलुक भूमि आपको जगह आपको देश आप देश ज निर्माण को निम्ति आपको जगह निर्माण को निम्ति दुई चारजना सपूत अथवा वीर व्यक्ति तस्ता वीर बिरंगना भूमि को निति आप प्राण को आहुति दिन भी सकू दुई चारजना नमरिकन हमी भूमि प्राप्त करना सकतेन जसरी बिहान बिहान मिर्मिर में मिर्मिर को बिहान अलि उजालो हो अवस्था उजालो होना आड़ता को अवस्था तो अवस्था में जी बेला तारा खसर जा अथवा तारा आकाश बट जब हटे जहाँ खसर जस पच्चीस उजालो हो उजालो भैस हम आकाश में तारा देखना सकतेन उजालो होना को निति तारा ने आपने अस्तित्व हराँच उसके आपनपन हराँच उसको अस्तित्व हराँच अस्ति आकाश बट तारा को अस्तित्व हराने को दिन हो उजालो हो उजालो हो उजालो भैसे तारा देखिदन आकाश में जसरी उजालो होना को निति बिहान होना को निति तारा झरे जारा को अस्तित्व हराँच तेरी नई दुई चारजना सपूत मरे पी मूलुक बनी आपको भूमि बनि आप जगह बनि यहाँ कवि मूलुक बंड को निति आप जगह बना को निति दुई चारजना मर्न पर्च ओट में हाँसो गाला में लाली जब आँच जगत को देश को पीर ने भेटी जब वीर ने चढ़ाऊँ रगत को यहाँ कवि जगत बने संसार संसार ते बेला मात्र हाँस अथवा आपको भूमि आपको जगह ते बेला मात्र हाँस ओठ में हाँसो गाला में लाली यो जगह ते बेला मात्र हाँस हम मतृभूमि हम जगह हम जन्मभूमि ते बेला मात्र हाँस ते बेला मत खुशी होे जी बेला देश को चिंता कर देश को सोच राखे वीर ने प्राण को आहुति दथवा आपको रगत बगाऊँ आप रगत बगन भी ऊ तत्पर बन हाँसी हाँसी उसके के आपको प्राण को भेटी चढ़ाऊँ भन्न पर्द प्राण को भेटी चढ़ाने को प्राण अर्पण कर आप प्राण अर्पण कर रगत बगा आप प्राण अर्पण कर ऊ तत्पर बन ते बेला यह जगत हम भूमि हम जगह खुशी होवा हमी प्राप्त करवि घाटी घाटी में फांसी को माला गाँसी वीर ने हाँस मतृभूमि को चरण ढोगी भाग्द दासता दासता यहाँ कवि जब एटा वीर व्यक्ति वीर व्यक्ति घाटी में फांसी लगाकर अथवा फांसी को माला लगाकर डोरी लगा मर्न को निति ऊ तत्पर हो देश को निम्ति हाँसी हाँसी जसरी हमी दुर्गा मल्ल देखना सकस यहां वीर योद्धा आजादी को समय में देश स्वतंत्रता को समय में यहां धेर वीर थे जिससे हाँसी हाँसी आपको प्राण को आहुति दिए हाँसी हाँसी आपको प्राण देश को आजादी को निम्ति देश को स्वतंत्रता को निम्ति उन्नी प्राण को आहुति दिए यहाँ पर कवि ऊ हाँसी हाँसी घाटी में पासो लगा अथवा फांसी को माला लगा ऊ हाँस के को लगी भादा खेल देश को निति ऊ हाँसी हाँसी मर्न तत्पर होतृभूमि को लगी मतृभूमि ढोगे मतृभूमि को चरण में पड़े म मर्न भी तत्पर छु भाई बेला दासता कमापन दासत्व को जिंदगी हटे जा 
अथवा त्यो दासत्व अर्काको अधीनमा बस्ने जुन अवस्था छ त्यो अवस्था चाहिँ हटेर जानको निम्ति चाहिँ वीरले आफ्नो प्राणको आहुति दिन पनि तत्पर हुनु पर्छ आफ्नो रगत बगाउन पनि तत्पर हुनु पर्छ आफ्नो मातृभूमिको चरण ढोगेर घाटीमा फाँसी लाग्दाखेरि पनि उ हाँसी हाँसी जब मर्न तत्पर हुन्छ त्यति बेला चाहिँ आफ्नो भूमि हाम्रो जग्गा चाहिँ सुरक्षित हुन्छ अथवा हामीले दासत्वलाई हटाउन सक्छौँ भन्ने कविको विचार छ कविको भनाइ छ उम्रन न भोट कसैले बिउ छरेर नगए बन्दैन मुलुक दुई चार सपुत मरेर नगए जसरी बारीमा अथवा खेतमा जबसम्म हामी बीज लगाउँदैनौँ बीज नलगाएसम्म त्यहाँ बिरुवा उम्रदैन बोट उम्रेदैन बोट उम्रनको निम्ति त्यहाँ बीज रोपिनु पर्छ त्यस्तै प्रकारले दुई चार जना व्यक्ति जब मर्न तत्पर हुँदैन त्यति बेलासम्म चाहिँ मुलुक बनिँदैन मुलुक बनिनको निम्ति दुई चार जना सपुतले मर्न पनि तत्पर हुनुपर्छ भन्ने कविको भनाइ छ हामीले खाने प्रत्येक खानामा रगत छ सहितको हामीले फेर्ने प्रत्येक चालमा छ धड्कन सहितको यहाँले यहाँ कविले भनेका छन् हामीले खाने प्रत्येक खानामा रगत छ सहितको भन्नुको तात्पर्य हो यो भूमि जुन भूमिमा उब्जनी भएको उर्वर यो भूमि जुन भूमि छ यो भूमिमा साग सब्जी विभिन्न खाने खाद्यान्नहरू जुन प्रकारको उत्पादन भइरहेको छ यो उत्पादन भएको यो भूमिमा सहितको रगतले सिँचेको छ यहाँनिर ती वीर योद्धाहरूको रगत बगेको भूमि हो यो भूमि यो भूमिमा ती वीर योद्धाहरूको रगत बगेको छ अनि त्यो रगत बगेको भूमिमा उब्जाएका चिजहरू तपाईँ हामीले हामी सबैजनाले ग्रहण गर्छौँ खान्छौँ हामीले त्यो यही खेतमा यही बारीमा फलेका चिजहरू उब्जनी भएका चिजहरू हामी ग्रहण गरिरहेका हुन्छौँ र यहाँनिर कविले भन्नुको तात्पर्य के हो भने त्यो खानामा पनि काहीँ न कतै सानोभन्दा पनि सानो देन चाहिँ सहितको छ सहितको रगत बगेको भूमिमा उब्जेको खाना हामी खाँदैछौँ यसैले गर्दा हाम्रो खानामा पनि सहितको रगत छ भनेर कविले भनेका छन् सहितको त्यहाँनिर योगदान छ हामीले खाने खानामा पनि सहितको योगदान छ भनेर कविले भनेका छन् अनि हामीले जुन श्वास प्रश्वास हाम्रो चलिरहेको छ हाम्रो जुन धड्कन हाम्रो श्वास प्रश्वास जुन चलिरहेको छ यो धड्कनमा हामी जिउन पाउनु हामी खुलेर जिउन पाउनु आज हामी जुन प्रकारले खुलेर एउटा खुल्ला वातावरणमा बस्न पाइरहेका छौँ उन्मुक्त वातावरणमा बस्न पाइरहेका छौँ खुल्ला रूपमा हामी हिँडिरहेका जोडि डुलिरहेका छौँ यो कसको योगदान भन्दा शहीदहरूको त्याग र बलिदानले गर्दा नै आज हामी हाम्रो भूमिमा सुरक्षित छौँ आज हामी खुल्ला रूपमा हिँड्न पाइरहेका छौँ भनेर कवि भूपि शेरसनले भनेका छन् हाम्रो खुसीको प्रत्येक पलमा छ जीवन सहितको हामी खुसी हुँदा हामी आनन्दित हुँदा हामी हामीले खुसी प्रकट गर्दाखेरि पनि त्यसको पनि कसको देन छ त्यसमा पनि सहितकै देन छ सहितको देनले गर्दा नै हामीले हाम्रो जीवनमा हामी रमाउन पाइरहेका छौँ खुसी हुन पाइरहेका छौँ पाउने थिएनौँ खुसी तिनले छोडेर नगए यदि सहीदले यो भूमिको निम्ति केही नगरिदिएको भए ती वीर योद्धाहरूले यो भूमिको निम्ति लडेर आफ्नो प्राणको आहुति नदिएको भए आज हामी यसरी सुरक्षित हुने थिएनौँ आज हामी यसरी खुल्ला वातावरणमा हिँड्न पाउने थिएनौँ आज हामी सायद हाम्रो जीवन दासत्वकै जीवन हुने थियो होला तर आज हामीले जुन एउटा उन्मुक्तिको जीवन पाएका छौँ एउटा खुल्ला जीवन पाएका छौँ यो उन्मुक्तिको जीवन पाउनुमा सहीदहरूको महत्त्वपूर्ण योगदान छ भनेर कवि भूपि शेरचनले आफ्नो कविता सहीदहरूको सम्झनामा भनेका छन् हामीले आफ्नो कर्तव्य विषय बिर्से इतिहासले धिकारला गोली निलेका सहीदका प्यारा ती लाजले धिकारला यहाँनिर पनि कविले भनेका छन् यदि यति हुँदा हुँदै पनि हामीले हाम्रो कर्तव्य बिर्स्यौँ भनेदेखि हाम्रो हाम्रो जुन दायित्व छ जिम्मावारी छ सहीदहरूप्रति नतमस्तक हुनु सहीदहरूले गरेको त्याग र बलिदानको कदर गर्नु सहीदहरूले गरेको गुणको स्मरण गर्नु सहीदहरूको सम्झना गर्ने काम हामीले आज गरेनौँ भनेदेखि चाहिँ हामीलाई चाहिँ इतिहासले धिक्कार छ भनेर कविले भनेका छन् ती तातो गोली खाएर आफ्नो प्राणको आहुति दिएका ती सहीदहरूले हामीलाई धिकार्नेछन् यही कारणले गर्दा हामीले सहीदलाई सधैँ स्मरण गर्नुपर्छ सहीदहरू प्रात स्मरणीय छन् सधैँ स्मरणमा रहनेछन् हाम्रो निम्ति सहीदहरू पूजनीय छन् ती वीर योद्धाहरू सधैँ हाम्रो निम्ति पूजनीय रहनेछन् धरतीले मुख लाजले छोप्ला आकाशले धिकारला सहीद रोलान हामीले उन्नति गरेर नगाई अब यहाँनिर कविले भनेका छन् यदि हामीले सहीदहरूलाई 
मूल्यांकन कर सकेन शहीद को त्याग बलिदान को कदर कर सकेन देखि ते बेला धरती पर लजाऊ अरे धरती ले लाजले मुख धरती ने मुख से लाज ले के छोप्छर यहाँ कवि भागन को अर्थ धरती भी लजाऊन भन्न को अर्थ धरती धरती लज्जित होने काम से हमें कर कवि यहाँ सांकेतिक अर्थ में धरती लज्जित बनाने काम से यदि हमी हम कर्तव्य बिर्स हम दायित्व बिर्स जिम्मेवारी बिर्स शहीद प्रति हम जो श्रद्धा को भावना होने पर्ने त्यो हरा गए धरती लज्जित हो अनि आकाश ने भी हमीर धिकार धरती रकाश ने धिकाने काम से हमीन अनि ती शहीद को ती वीर शहीद धिकाने काम से हमीन इतिहास ने धिकाने काम से हमीन कवि भूपी शेरसन ने शहीद रोलान हमी उन्नति कर नगई इसी शहीद त्याग कर आप प्राण को उत्सर्ग कर आप जीवन नई समर्पण करें यो भूमि यो उर्वर भूमि हमीर छोड़े गए हम एटा खुला परिवेश तैयारी कर हम एटा उन्मुक्त वातावरण तैयारी कर डर रस को परिवेश देखि परिस्थिति देखि हमी उन्मुक्त कराईद यो तो परिस्थिति में हमीर उन्नति कर सकेन यो भूमि उर्वर बना सकेन यो भूमि में हमी कर्म कर सकेन असल कार्य कर हम अगड़ी बढ़ना सकेन देखि तो शहीद को आत्मा पर रुं अथवा शहीद भी रुं शहीद रोलान हमी उन्नति कर नगे शहीद को आत्मा ने हमी हि सरी शहीद रुने काम से हमी जसरी यो भूमि को निति हम हम प्रत्येक व्यक्ति यो देश को नागरिक को निति शहीद जो त्याग बलिदान करो स्मरण कर हम परम कर्तव्य हो शहीद कदर कर शहीद सम्मान कर हम परम कर्तव्य हो कर्तव्य हमी चूक होमी भूल हमी बिर्स होते कवि भूपी शेरसन ने यदि हमी उन्नति कर सकेन यो उर्वर भूमि शहीद हम छोड़ीद यो उर्वर भूमि यो जगह यो भूमि भूभाग में हमी उन्नति कर सकेन देखि शहीद रोया कवि होन बिहान मिर्मिरे में तारा झरे नगए बंदन मूलुक दुई चार सपूत मर नगए फेरी यहाँ कवि अंत में जसरी मूलुक बन को निति दुई चारजना व्यक्ति दुई चारजा सपूत ने प्राण को आहुति दून पर्च जसरी बिहान उजालो होना को निति तारा झरे जान तारा ने आपको अस्तित्व हराँच तारा झरे गए पे बिहान को उजालो हो बिहान को मिर्मिरे में तारा जब हरा जा तारा झरे जान ते पीछे बिहान को उजालो हो बिहान उजालो होने बखत में बिहान को मिर्मिरे को समय में जब अलि अंध्यारो अलि उजालो हुए अवस्था में तारा बिस्तारी एक देखि अर्क एक देखि अर्क करते तारा त्याँ लुप्त होकाश बा हरा जाति बेला पूरा उजालो हम देख्स पूरा उजालो भाई तारा देखिदन तारा ने आपने अस्तित्व हरा बिहानी आँच अथवा बिहानी शुभ बिहानी हमी देखा पर्च देखना पाँच देखा पर्च तेरी नई शहीद को त्याग बलिदान ने शहीद को आप जीवन शहीद जीवन उत्सर्ग को कारण यो मूलुक बनी मूलुक बनीन को निति शहीद को त्याग बलिदान चाहिए शहीद को बलिदान ने शहीद को त्याग ने शहीद मर गई कारण नहीं आज हम देश बनी भूभाग बनी मूलुक बनीन को निति दुई चारजा मं मन पर्चर शहीद को समझना शीर्षक कविता में कवि भूपी शेरसन ने खूब राम प्रकार के शहीद को कार्य अहीद प्रति हम जिम्मेवारी हम कर्तव्य शहीद प्रति हमी पर्ने श्रद्धा लाई खूब राम प्रकार के वर्णन करो शहीद को समझना शीर्षक कविता में रवि भूपी शर्सन ने यहाँ खूब राम मीठो मानवता को सन्देश हम मानव भैसे हमारे में मानवीय मूल्य रनवीय कर्तव्य हो मानवीय मूल्य रनवीय कर्तव्य बोक हमी हम 
त्याग र बलिदान दिएका शहीदहरुलाई हामीले स्मरण गर्न सक्नु पर्छ कदर गर्न सक्नु पर्छ शहीदहरुलाई सम्मान गर्न सक्नु पर्छ ती वीरहरु ती शहीदहरु प्रात स्मरणीय छन् सधैं पूजनीय छन् सधैं वन्दनीय छन् हामीले ती शहीदहरुलाई सधैं स्मरण गरिरहनु पर्छ भनेर शहीदहरुको सम्झना गर्दै लेखेको यो कविता भूपि शेरचनको कविता हामीले पढ्यौ पाठ 8 मा आईसीएससी 12 औं श्रेणीका विद्यार्थीहरुको निम्ति यो नेपाली विषयको पाठ्यक्रम अन्तर्गत पढ्ने कविता हामीले पढिसकेपछि फेरि अर्को सेसनमा हामी विद्यार्थीहरुलाई अर्को नयाँ पाठ लिएर आउने छौ नयाँ पाठ लिएर हामी चर्चा परिचर्चा गर्ने छौ र त्यतिन्जेल सम्मको निम्ति म विद्यार्थीहरुलाई फेरि एकचोटी यो कविता पढिसकेपछि यो कविताको सारांश मूल भाव यो कविताको मूल भाव मैले अहिले व्याख्या गरेको छु यो मूल भाव घरमा बसेर नै विभिन्न ठाउँमा शरीर बसेका नेपाली लिने विद्यार्थीहरु चाहे भारतको विभिन्न ठाउँमा सिक्किममा बस्ने विद्यार्थी हुन् दार्जिलिङ कालिम्पोङ खरसाङ सिलगढी जहाँ पनि बस्ने विद्यार्थी हुन् जहाँ बसेर पनि विद्यार्थीहरु नेपाली विषयको तयारी गरिरहेका छन् विद्यार्थीहरुलाई म आग्रह गर्दछु यो कविताको मूल भाव यो कविताको सारांश आफ्नो कपीमा लेख्ने राम्रोसँग लेख्ने अनि शुद्ध गरेर लेख्ने अभ्यास गर्ने अनि त्यहाँ यहाँबाट भित्रबाट पनि कविताको कुनै पनि लहर कुनै पनि पंक्ति दिएर प्रश्न सोधिएको हुन्छ यस माथि मैले अगाडीको सेसनमा अगाडीको क्लासमा पनि चर्चा गर्दै आइरहेको छु प्रश्न सोधिएको हुन्छ अवतरण दिएर कविताको पंक्ति दिएर त्यसको निम्ति पनि तयारी गर्ने अनि कुनै दुईवटा तीनवटा पंक्ति जस्तो उदाहरणको लागि हुँदैन बियान मिरबिरमा तारा झरेर नगए बन्दैन मुलुक दुई चार सपुत मरेर नगए यस कविता को यस पंक्ति को व्याख्या गर भनेर पनि दिएको हुन्छ त्यसमाथि पनि व्याख्या गर्नको निम्ति पनि विद्यार्थीहरुले तयार गर्ने राम्रो प्रकारले तयारी गरेर 2021 को परीक्षाको निम्ति यो शहीदहरुको सम्झना शीर्षक कविताबाट प्रश्न आएको खण्डमा विद्यार्थीहरुले राम्रो प्रकारले उत्तर लेख्ने आग्रह गर्दै यो लकडाउन को समयमा पढाइएको अनलाइन शिक्षा को सदुपयोग गरेर यसको फाइदा लिएर विद्यार्थीहरुले राम्रो प्रकारले घरमा बसेर प्रश्न पत्रहरु मार्फत बोर्ड एग्जाम को अगिल्लो एग्जाम को प्रश्न पत्रहरु छ भने जस्तो 2020 को 2019 को 2018 को 2017 को 16 को 15 को विद्यार्थीहरुसँग प्रश्न पत्रहरु छ भने कमसेकम 3-4 वर्षको 5 वर्ष सम्मको प्रश्न पत्रहरु हेर्ने त्यहाँबाट निबन्ध लेखन माथि पनि अभ्यास गर्ने बोध कम्प्रिहेन्सन दिएको हुन्छ त्यहाँबाट पनि प्रश्न गर्ने अभ्यास गर्ने ग्रामरबाट पनि शब्द भण्डारहरुबाट वाग्धाराहरुबाट प्रश्न गर्ने अभ्यास प्रश्नको उत्तर लेख्ने अभ्यास गर्ने अनि साहित्य खण्डबाट जुन चारवटा प्रश्नको उत्तर गर्नुपर्ने हुन्छ त्यसको पनि अभ्यास विद्यार्थीहरुले गर्ने आग्रह गर्छु अनि यसरी नै राम्रो प्रकारले तयारी गरेर घरमा बसेर राम्रो एउटा पढ्ने वातावरण तयार गर्दिन म अभिभावकहरुलाई पनि पुनः एकचोटी आग्रह गर्दै विद्यार्थीहरुलाई ओ श्रेणी कोठामा आएर पढ्न नपाएको दुःख त छदै छ धेरै समस्याहरु पनि भइरहेको होला साथीभाइहरुसँग भेट्न नपाएको समस्या पनि छदै छ है क्लासमा आएर पढ्दाको जुन आनन्द थियो त्यो आनन्द विद्यार्थीहरुले पाउन सकेका छैनन् तथापि घरै बसेर भए पनि विद्यार्थीहरुले पढ्ने आफ्नो अध्ययनलाई निरन्तरता दिने आग्रह गर्दै आजको पाठलाई म यही अन्त गर्न चाहन्छु धन्यवाद Good morning. Welcome back to the next episode of online classes. My topic today is the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Okay. Now, as this Indo-Gangetic Plain is a continuation of the chapter Relief, which I had already started in the previous uh, episode. Okay, and I had finished the first physiographic division, and that was the mountain complex. Now, today I'm going to start with the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Okay. Now, this Indo-Gangetic Plain is also known as the Great Northern Plains of India and supposed to be one of the most fertile stretches of land that we have in our country. Okay. Now, this Indo-Gangetic Plain, the, mm, this shaded portion that you see out here is the entire stretch of the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Okay. And other terms, other uh, names that has been given to this Indo-Gangetic Plain, it's also known as the Indus Ganga Plain. It is also known as the Great Northern Plains. Northern Indian River Plains. Okay, these are the alternative uh, terms that has been given to this area, and it is around 630 million acres of fertile stretches of land that you have in the northern regions of the Indian subcontinent. Okay, now 
before I go to the next uh, slide, okay, now just let me tell you the formation of the endogangetic. Planes. I have already mentioned this to you that Indo-Gangetic Plain as I told you is a very fertile stretch of land that you have in the country. Now the formation of the Indo-Gangetic Plain, uh, let me go back to the previous uh, episode which I had explained you all about the formation of the Himalayas. Okay? Now remember millions of years ago the earth that you had was a solid landmass okay? and this solid landmass was been surrounded by water. Okay, and then later on it was been split into two due to movements. Okay, now this continent movement or movement of this continent was put forward by the father of geography, Alfred Wegener. So his theory is also known as uh, Wegener's theory of continental drift. So according to him, the continents were drifting. Okay, so when this continent, this huge solid Pangaea, was split into two. One was known as Laurasia and the other one was known as the Gondavana. Okay? And it was separated by a sea called the Tethys Sea. Now, now, when I talk about the formation of the Indo-Gangetic Plain, okay? now indo the southern regions of our country, if you look at the southern portion of our country, this portion, this part of our country, it was a part of the Gondavana land. And this portion was along with Africa, South America, uh, you know, along with Australia, it was in the Gondavana region. Now, some portion due to movement, some portion or uh, certain uh, part of this land from the Gondavana split and went upward and collided with some land masses out here in Laurasia. Okay? So, when this portion of the land which went up collided with this, now remember, the sediments that got deposited out here raised up forming series of folds and that series of folds led to the formation of the Himalayas. Now once this material that had got deposited in the bed of the sea raised up led to the formation of the Himalayas, now that portion was a hollow. Okay, so because all the sediments had come out, there was a hollow that was being created. Okay, so this indo portion that you have, this area that you had once upon a time or millions of years ago was a part of the Tethys Sea. In other words, you can say it was a part of the Tethys Sea. Got it? So now, once the sediments from this, I'm not saying the entire Tethys Sea was this area, but the entire stretch of, part of that entire stretch of the Tethys Sea was this indo plain. Okay? Now, the material that got deposited in this part of the Tethys Sea, millions of years ago, raised up, forming series of folds, led to the formation of the Himalayas. There was a hollow that was being created. Okay, after the Himalayas was being formed, the rivers started flowing from there. Okay, and these rivers were perennial rivers, carried materials with it, and that materials got deposited in that hollow, one after the other, resulting in the formation of a vast stretch of a fertile plain known as the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Understood? That's the history about the formation of the Indo-Gangetic areas. Okay. Now you come to the next one. Now the, why it is known as the Indo-Gangetic Plains? Okay. Sometimes it's also known as Indo-Gangetic Brahmaputra Plain. The reason behind is because it has been formed by the three mighty rivers, Indus along with the tributaries, Ganga along with the tributaries and Brahmaputra along the tributaries and the stretches of this entire you know uh, indo plain is 2400 kilometers almost the same stretch that you had when we talked about the extension of the Himalayas now remember Himalayas were also approximately 2400 kilometers running parallel to this Himadri, Himachal and the Shivalex the entire stretch of this indo plain is also 2400 kilometers okay and it is starting from Satlaj to the Ganga out here okay and the width of this indo gangetic plain on an average is 150 to 300 kilometers which means there are certain areas uh, where it is more than 300 and certain areas less than 150 like for example in Assam it's very narrow almost around 90 kilometers and in Allahabad, it is wide, um, to an, uh, almost around 280 kilometers. That's the uh, important characteristic feature of this Indo-Gangetic plains. Okay? 
then you come to the next one now when you are talking about this indo gangetic planes out here okay now you have to know some of the relief features you have to know some of the relief features out here of the planes there are four important terms that has been associated with this uh, planes indo gangetic planes of india one is the bhabar the tarai the bhangar and the khadar okay now these four terms if you go through your iisc question paper now these differences between these four terms is usually seen in the question paper so you have to be very careful out your differences they will ask you at least a minimum of three differences please memorize it remember that and whenever you are writing the differences please i have written point wise but please make try to make a column two columns and then write the differences okay now the first one is the bhabar followed by the tarai the bhangar and the khadar okay now in this also let me just explain you all okay uh, now just let me make certain things clear now for common people like us okay when we talk about the plains the first thought that comes to our mind is a flat level land but plains are not flat level land it's it's a gently sloping undulated landforms okay like for example now we talk about the himalayas now himalayas you know it is steep like this okay the himalayan regions are steep like this then this supposing if this is the foothills shivaliks from the shivaliks starts the plains okay now it is not a flat level land like this we think when we talk about the plains we know we think that it's a flat level land like this but actually it's not a flat level land like this it is a gentle sloping area and as it comes towards the mouth it almost becomes flat like this when it's about to enter the sea the land forms becomes like this okay now when i talk about the bhabar bhabar is the foothills once the himalayas comes to an end now let me explain you all this way once the himalayas comes to an end this is the foothills then you start with the plains now i said it's a gently sloping area now when i talk about the gently sloping area okay now this gent from the steep slope when a gentle sloping area begins the first feature that you see out here is the bhabar now bhabar it stretches from indus to tista it's just a narrow belt just 8 to 16 kilometers wide and another important thing that you have to remember is that it comprises of pebble studded rocks so what i'm talk talking out here is what i'm trying to tell you all is now this is the himalayas most of the rivers are starting from the himalayan regions now himalayas are steep you know and the rivers which is originating from the himalayas because of the steep slope it flows very swiftly the velocity is very high the rate of erosion is also very high so it carries different sizes of particles like stones pebbles boulders you know pebbles sand silt all these materials of bigger sizes as well as smaller sizes have been carried okay so now when it comes to this foothills now the steepness of this area is less so now particles of bigger size gets deposited here particles starts getting deposited here particles of bigger sizes small sizes is carried further but particles of bigger sizes gets settled here like pebbles and all that okay so this stretches of an area in the foothills okay in the foothills of the himalayas and the area where the plains begins is known as the bhabar okay and it comprises of particles of bigger sizes now since it is the size of the particles are bigger it is porous in nature which means it is soft okay and being porous small narrow rivers or water that is being flowing through this area most of the waters gets seeped through it gets seeped water gets seeped because of the porous nature of the soil that is being present there that's the characteristic feature of a bhabar okay now next to the bhabar running parallel to it is the tarai now remember this is bhabar running parallel to it is the tarai okay one of the most important thing about the tarai is 
Just remember, south of the Babar, running parallel to it is Tarai. One of the most important features of the Tarai, or Tarai is, uh, uh, this area becomes a Tarai region, or a marshy track of a land, because of the re-emergence of the underground stream, which means, now I told you, these areas are stone pebbled, stones and pebbles and all these particles of bigger size are getting deposited. Now, since the particles of bigger size have been just getting deposited over there, this area is porous. Because of the porous nature, water seeps through. Okay. Now, this water which has been seeped through comes out or re-emerges in the Tarai region. That's the significance of the Tarai, re-emergence of the underground stream. Now, because of this water that has seeped underneath, comes out or re-emerges in the Tarai region. Tarai area is very marshy, wet, marshy track of a land. Understood? So it is because of plenty of water that is being present over there. It becomes a marshy track of a land, or it also becomes a wet land. Okay, and consists of finer deposits out here. Not very fine deposit, but consists of finer deposit when compared to that of Babar. Okay, and another important thing that you have to remember is that uh, there is a thick forest in this area, and it's because of the thick forest out here it becomes a, a you know a home for the wildlife. Okay, and agriculture also flourishes here. One difference is that in this Babar area, agriculture does not flourish. Uh, you will not see agriculture been flourishing in that area. The reason behind is because less water has been there, because all disappears, the stream disappears. And in the Tarai region, because of the re-emergence of that water and the area becoming wet and marshy, you find agriculture been flourishing in this area. So that's the difference between a Bhabar and the Tarai. So we come, we finished with the Bhabar area, we finished with the Tarai area. Now we are coming to the lower areas of the Plains. Okay. Now we come to the lower areas of the plain. The next thing that you have to remember, okay, <coughs> is the bhangar and the kadar. Now, before I um, come to this diagram and explain you all, now just remember bhangar is known as the old deposits of alluvial, and kadar is known as the new deposits of alluvial. Okay. And another difference is bhangar. The soil has been found far from the river basin, and this is closer to the river basin. Uh, the soil is less fertile out here, therefore not suitable for agriculture. The soil is very fertile, therefore it is suitable for agriculture. Okay, that's the difference. Please memorize it. But let me just explain it to you all. Okay, now after the ba this Babar Tarai, now we are going coming towards the plains. Now out here the land was gently sloping. Okay, river was being flowing through a gently sloping area. Now when you're talking about the ba uh, Bhangar and the Khadar, we are coming to an area where the river is about to enter the sea. Okay. Now what happens is, uh, the land is almost, uh, not flat, but almost flat. A gentle slope has been present over there. So in these areas, you find the Bhangar and the Khadar. Bhangar means old alluvial. Now whenever river has been flowing, remember rivers are always carrying fine silt particles with it, well, alluvial materials. Okay. And that alluvial material, in the third stage of a river. Now, the first stage of, again, let me clarify this also. In the first stage of a river, river is being flowing through the Himalayan area. So, now remember river, the velocity, the speed, the rate of erosion is very high. Now, when it comes to the second course of a river, the, the, this area of Babar and Tarai and all, uh, you'll find more of deposition, transportation and deposition taking places. Okay. But when you come to the third stage of a river, where the river is about to enter the sea, you'll find more of deposition. So materials are getting deposited out here. So in the third stage, okay, because of almost a flat level land or a gentle sloping land, the materials which has been carried by the river is either getting deposited at the bed of the river or along the side of a river, along the side of a river or along the bed of the river. So now what happens is Khadar, River is flowing, the material is getting deposited one on top of the other, and that is called the bunker, old alluvial deposits. When it comes to Khadar, Khadar is in the lower area, closer to the sea. So now what happens is, this area, floods are taking places. Understood? Floods are taking places. So rivers are flowing, materials are getting deposited, but every year because of this area being flooded, 
the new material, the material which has got deposited has been carried away and a new material is getting deposited. Am I clear what I am trying to say? Out here, Bhangar, in other words, I can just let me simplify this. Now, for example, you know, when you talk about Siliguri, Siliguri is a plane. Okay? Then you come to Jalpaiguri, Jalpaiguri is also a plane. Okay? Then you come to Malda, okay? Malda is also a plane. But if you see the altitude of Malda, if you see the altitude of Siliguri, if you Jalpaiguri, now Siliguri, Jalpaiguri is a little higher altitude than Malda. Now, we have not heard about floods taking place in Siliguri. Although Siliguri is a plane, we have not heard about floods taking place in Siliguri. But Malda has been flooded. That means it is in a lower altitude. The, all these are planes, but this is in a lower altitude, this is in a higher altitude. So materials which is getting deposited in the higher altitude, because where the floods are not taking place, is called the Bhangar. And the ones where the materials are getting deposited, but floods are taking place every year, it's called the Khadar, a new deposits of alluvial. So I hope this example will make it clear. So that's the difference between a Bhangar and the Khadar. Now you come to another terms, another uh, feature that has been associated with the indo gangetic plane is the Bur. Okay, you have to know the definition. A Bur is an elevated piece of land along the banks of the river, especially in River Ganga, I told you. Now when a river flows from its source to the mouth, source is the starting point and mouth is the ending point, okay, where the river ends the sea. The river has to cross through three stages, the upper course, the middle course and the lower course. Upper course the river is starting from the source. Source is always in the higher altitude. So the river which flows is very swift. Okay, Velocity is very high. Rate of erosion is also very high. And more materials are being carried. And particles of bigger size are also getting carried. Okay, When the river enters the second course, okay, uh, you have little bit of erosion taking places. Uh, transportation is there. And a little bit of Deposition. Deposition is hardly there, but few deposits here and there are taking places. But when you come to the low course of a river, low course of a river, almost in the entire stretch, you have the deposition taking places. And the deposition takes place, I said, either on the bed of the river or along the side of a river. So these materials which get deposited along the side of a river increases in its height. That elevated piece of land along the banks of a river is called the Okay, the next one is called Barinth. Now, this is the deltaic region that you have in Bengal having deposits of laterite. Okay, then you have another feature that is Barkhan. Barkhan is also known as Barchans. Okay, and Barkhan or Barchans are sand dunes that you find mostly in the desert areas. It is in a shape, it's a Christian shaped sand dunes which has been found in the desert areas of Rajasthan and it is also called Barkhan or Bachans and mostly been found in Barmer and Jaisalmer. Now you can also say that it is in a shape of a cashew nut. Okay, it is Christian shaped, shape of a cashew nut and uh, it's a sand hill, nothing else but it's a sand hill okay, or a sand dunes and it's mostly been found in the desert areas. And why this term has been associated in the Gangetic Plain is because a part, Rajasthan is also a part of the Indo Gangetic areas. So you will find Bachans also there. So these are the terms that you have to remember. Now we come to the classification or the regional division of the plains. Now, when we come to the regional division of the plains, the first division is the plain of Rajasthan. Okay? Plain of Rajasthan. Now, all the important things that I have, whatever important features that you have to, you have to remember, I have all given your point wise. So please go through this. Okay, occupied by Thar or the Great Indian Desert. Okay, it's in this area. Okay, it's an undulating plain, not a flat level line, but slightly up and down there, undulating, with an average height of about 325 meters. It is also known as Marustali. Okay, and the eastern part of the Smarustali desert area is a rocky. Okay, and the western part has shifting sand dunes, which I explained in the previous slide, which is also known as the Barkhan or the Barchans. And eastern part of this desert up to the Aravali is also known as the Rajasthan Bagar. Okay, and the rainfall out here is 25.
meters and that's one of the characteristic feature why this area is a desert because it's getting rainfall less than 25 centimeters but one thing you have to remember in this uh, plains of Rajasthan is that from the Aravali hills here you have the parts of Rajasthan here you have the Aravali hills here okay now from this Aravali hills a seasonal river flows and that seasonal river is called the Luni river this is the only river that has been draining through some areas of Rajasthan, making that area fertile and agriculture has been flourishing. But remember, this Luni River is a uh, seasonal river only. And another important thing about this Luni River is that it's an example of an inland drainage. Okay, it's an example of an inland drainage. Why it is known as an inland drainage is because this river neither drains into the Arabian Sea nor drains into the Bay of Bengal. It arises in the hills of the Aravalis and drains into a lake which is inside the country only. That is in Rajasthan there is a lake and that lake is called the Sambar Lake. Okay, That lake is called the Sambar Lake. And please remember one of the most important uh, uh, factor that tells you that millions of years ago Millions of years ago, this indo gangetic area was a part of a Tethys Sea, which I explained it to you all. Okay? It's been proved by the presence of this lake. It's on the land, Rajasthan. It's called the Sambar Lake. And this lake is an example of a salt lake. Is it clear? So this river Luni arises in the hills of the Aravalis and drains into a lake and that lake is the Sambar lake and this Sambar lake is the last remnant la last bit of land that has been left which tells us that is a part of the Tethys last rem or in other words you can say it's a last remnant of the Tethys sea that's the important characteristic feature or the important things that you have to learn in the plains of Rajasthan okay now you come to the next plane, next, next division of the plane and that's called the Punjab plane. Okay? Now Punjab plane is also known as, or, the, or Punjab is also known as a land of five rivers. Okay? Now this plane has been formed by five important rivers, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Satlaj and Bees. Okay? And since you find important rivers that is being flowing all this, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Satlaj and all these Bees, Okay, you will find a land that has been formed between the two rivers and that is called a dob. Or in other words, dob is a land between the two rivers and there are so many dobs that you find in Punjab. Okay, like for example, example Sin Sagar dob, okay, Rachna dob, okay, Bari dob, at least you should remember at least two or three names. Okay, examples of, they might ask you what is a dobe and give two examples from India. So just remember, dobe is a land between the two rivers. An example, Rachna dobe, or Bari dobe, or, or Bish, uh, uh, Sinsagar dobe, okay, Bis dobe. So these names or examples can be written down. Total area is 1.75 lakh square kilometers, 250 meters above the sea level. Okay, and another important thing that you have to remember is that this area, okay, has been drained by numerous seasonal streams okay and this numerous seasonal stream along with the major rivers numerous seasonal streams are also being present and that is called the Chos and Chos the northern part of the plain which has been eroded by numerous seasonal streams is called the Chos now this has to be remembered Chos they might ask you what do you mean by a Chos and the other term that you have to remember is the bet land okay now this is a flood plain that has been formed by the repeated de deposition of a new alluvial materials during each flood that means this is an area which has been formed by the deposits of new alluvial materials every year because i told you it's like khadar every year floods are taking places materials are getting deposited that material has been taken by the floods, another new material is getting deposited. So it's a flood plain with a deposition of new alluvial materials every year. That is called a bed land. Okay, so choice bed land, very important. 
Now you come to the largest plane. When we did the division of the planes, uh, Rajasthan plane, then you come to Punjab plane, and then you come to the Ganga plane, which is the largest among all the three planes. Ganga plane is supposed to be the largest. Okay, now you have the planes of Rajasthan here. Okay, then you have the Satla Jamuna plane that is in Punjab, that area. Okay, and then from this area down till here is the entire stretch of the Ganga plain. Now, since the area is very vast, okay, this plain has been divided into three upper Ganga, middle Ganga, and the lower Ganga. Okay, so this is the largest unit of the great plains from Delhi to Kolkata. Area is 3.75 lakh square kilometers. Okay, and uh, the formation under this formation, just remember that this plain is known as a Ganga plain because this plain has been formed by the river Ganga along with its tributaries. Now, please remember this river Ganga is one of the lengthiest river that you have in India. Okay, uh, this is the only river that drains the entire length of the river uh, drains through India. Okay, but having said this, let me clarify this also. Uh, approximately the length of you know Ganga River is around two five two five sorry five kilometers. This is the entire stretch of river Ganga from the mouth to the sorry from the source to the mouth from the Gangotri glacier to the mouth of the Ganges. Okay, when it enters through Bangladesh. Okay, that is the entire length. Out of this 2525 kilometers, almost around 110 kilometers of the stretch of this river Ganga flows in Bangladesh. Only 110 kilometers of this river Ganga flows in Bangladesh. The rest flows in India. So that is why India, the Ganga river is the lengthiest river in India, one of the longest river in India. Again, out again. Let me an clarify another thing. If you look at the length of river Indus, if you look at the length of river Brahmaputra, and if you look at the length of river Ganga, Brahmaputra and Indus is longer than Ganga. But Ganga is the lengthiest river or the longest river in India. The reason behind is because Brahmaputra river, although the length is more, it flows through three different countries, in Tibetan highlands. It flows to the Tibetan highlands, like called Zangpo River. Then in, it flows in India, like Brahmaputra River, and then flows in Bangladesh as Jam Jamuna River. Okay, so that length has to be divided. Like another one is Indus River. Indus River also uh, flows through the Indian territory, but the largest portion of this river flows through Pakistan. So when you divide the length, uh, the length becomes the shortest in India. But if you look at the Ganga River. Ganga River, the total length is 2525 kilometers. So, the entire stretch of the river from the mouth, okay, sorry, from the source till the mouth flows in India, except 110 kilometers that flows through Bangladesh as Padma. Okay, that is the name of Ganga River in Bangladesh. Okay, so since the river, the entire stretch of the river flows the Indian Territory, this river has been joined by tributaries like Kosi, Ganda, Ghagar and all this. So, the Ganga river along with the tributaries forms the largest plain in India. Okay, and that since it is large, it is not possible to study about the Ganga plain at one stretch. So, it has been divided to upper Ganga, middle Ganga and lower Ganga. Now, out your uh, shading, you know in your map work, they might ask you to shade the upper Ganga or the middle Ganga or the lower Ganga. So, shading is also very important, map work. Okay. So, the total uh, area that I talked about is 3.75 lakh square kilometers. Okay. And formation, I already told you, the entire river flows through this area and the formation is taken place because of the uh, materials which is being brought by the Ganga River along with the tributaries. Then, the general slope is towards the east and southeast and river flowing through this area are shifting their course leading to flood. So, there are some rivers which is being flowing, the tributaries of river Ganga which has been flowing through this area are known for shifting its course. Okay? Uh, and Kosi is an example of this and that is why Kosi river has always been referred to as uh, sorrow of Bihar because it leads to flood. Okay? 
and it is a notorious river, very naughty river because the course has been changed and that leads to flood. Now, to tame this river, you know, uh, a barrage has been constructed and that's called the Kosi barrage, okay, that, that is to tame the river Kosi, okay, that's the Ganga plain. Now, we come to the next plain that is called the Brahmaputra plain. Now, Brahmaputra plain, uh, the entire stretch where the river Brahmaputra flows, now it is also called Assam Valley because it flows, the entire stretch flows in Assam, okay, uh, or, or it is also known as Assam Plain or the Brahmaputra Valley. It is 640 kilometers in its length from Dubri to Sadia, okay, and it has been formed by River Brahmaputra along with its tributaries. Just remember that much, okay. Then you come to the last portion, that's the significance of the plains. Now, like the Himalayas, in the previous episode, I think I explained you all the significance of the Himalayas. Himalayas acting as a climatic barrier and defensive wall, okay, sources of large number of rivers. Like the Himalayas, plains also have its own significance, okay. The first important significance of the plain is that it is a flat land with huge deposits of alluvial soil. And remember, alluvial soil is one of the most fertile soil that you have in the country. Uh, this area has a flat land. Okay, and in this area, there are a large number of rivers that is been flowing, and they are all perennial rivers flowing very slowly, carrying huge materials with it, and that material is getting deposited, and lead, lead, and that is leading to the formation of the plains. Okay, and another important is that since it is in the foothills of the Himalayas, climatic conditions are also favorable, so you have high concentration of population because of the favorable climatic conditions. You know. Large number of people are living there, concentration of population is very high and it's not only because of the favorable climatic condition, the concentration of population is high, but you will find agriculture flourishing there and it's because of agriculture you find a lot of agro-based industries. So wherever agriculture has been flourishing, you have large number of industries being present okay, and that attracts large number of people. So therefore the concentration of population is very high. And since it's a flat level land with plenty of water, flat surface, fertile soil, uh, plenty of water is being present, favorable climatic condition. This plain is also known as the granary of India. Granary means the storehouse of India. There are states like Punjab, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh where you know various agricultural products of different crops or in other words different crops are being grown and therefore it's known as the granary of India and being a flat area, flat surface, it helps transport, okay. So you'll find a good network of roads and railways being const uh, constructed in this area and the rivers that is being flowing through this area, the lower cost of the rivers also helps, helps inland water transport, okay. And beside this, industries are being found over here. Now most of the industries are agro-based industries. So because of industries, it is leading to urbanization. So industrialization is leading to urbanization. So development is taking places in this area. And lastly, you will also, the significance of the plain is that you will also see that the origin of different religions has taken place in the plains of our country, like Hinduism, okay, Sufism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, all this religion okay, originated in the plains of India. So with this, I finished with the second physiographic division of uh, physiographic di relief, relief or physiographic or a relief division of India. Okay. Now, uh, I hope you have understood the entire explanation that I have done. Again, please go through. Okay. And uh, the next topic that is the Peninsular Plateau region of the Peninsular India and the coastal plains. I will do it in the next class. Thank you.